As we leave the number five turret handling room and move aft, we step over a trunk that leads down to emergency diesel room, generator room and also serves as an access trunk going all the way up to the main deck. Now, we're about to enter a mechanical wonderland. This is a, the aft steering compartment. You have to excuse the mess. Yeah, it's kind of messy looking because they were doing some very hard work in here a couple of months ago where they were uh, patching some leaks and also filling some of the voids and tanks beneath these areas with uh, foam to exclude any possible flooding. But we're going to talk about this room some because obviously it's very important. This is where the major uh, steering components are. First of all, I just came down this ladder. You'll see beneath that platform this large shaft. This start shaft extends back from the uh, steam steering engine room that's in the aft end of the starboard main engine room. And from here, it goes through this coupling device. Now this is essentially a clutch. There used to be a hand wheel here. By turning that hand wheel, it could couple and uncouple the, uh, the steam steering shaft from the rest of the mechanism. Why was it we need to do this? Well, because uh, while steam steering was the originally designed means of steering, we also had this very large 150 horsepower DC motor that could also be used to, uh, to steer it. So by uncoupling the shaft here from the steam steering engine, you could couple this electric motor. Now that electric motor was experimental at the time it was installed on Texas. And this is one of those experiments that proved to be wildly successful because the steam steering was actually kind of sloppy. In order to actuate that steam steering engine, it was coupled to mechanical shafts that went all the way up to the navigation bridge or into the uh, armored conning tower. Those shafts in turn would, would basically t uh, rotate valves in what's called the hydraulic telemotor and central station that would then send high pressure uh, hydraulic uh, fluid through tubes to actuate uh, slave cylinders that actually in turn actuate the steam steering engine. A lot of lag, a lot of parts, a lot of slop. But with this electric motor, you got instant results. By just using what I call the electric tiller, you could turn this motor one way or the other way to deflect the rudder right or left. The farther you turned that handle or electric tiller, the faster or slower it went. And here on this little stand is one of these is one of those electric tillers. So it's really just almost just a flick of the wrist, one way or the other. And in order to make it work, it was fed through this relay bank and into those weird little fin things. These are resistor banks. And if you, uh, if you started out, let's say you wanted to steer left, positive would go to positive on the motor, and you'd start out very slowly. And that, what that means is all those resistor banks would be added to this power circuit that would reduce the amperage and that motor would turn very slowly. The farther you move that switch over, the more of these resistors would be dropped out by these relays and the motor would turn faster. So you could either just move it over one notch and it would turn slowly or continue to move it and the rudder would move faster. Then to turn it the other way, you push the handle in the other direction and it would reverse polarity where positive is now on motor negative and the motor would run backwards. The helmsman, captain, crew, everybody loved this. It worked astoundingly well. The helmsman with a flick of the wrist could easily steer the ship almost like a game, a video game. Now, there is yet another way to steer, and that's back here. You always have to figure if all else fails, how are you gonna turn that rudder? Well, you could put about 16 of your best friends on that and they could haul on these mahogany wheels and they, the gearing was really, really low on it. And it, so it took for just about forever, but they could turn that rudder. And that's what they were able to accomplish with this. Now up on, that, on the rear bulkhead above that, you'll see there's a shaft coming out. 
but it doesn't go anywhere. Quite honestly, I'm not sure what was supposed to attach to it, but I do know that that is the end shaft for the rudder brake. Uh, when we go back into the rudder steering gear room, uh, you'll see that there is a rod that penetrates the bulkhead that goes back to a large band type brake that's real easily seen. So this is the steering, uh, aft steering room. Again, here's these resistors. We have the relays and then another little jewel is what's in this rusty box. One thing that you don't want are two people trying to steer this electrically at the same time. So the guys down here got to decide who steers the ship electrically. You know, what would happen if you have a guy on the helm that's wanting to put in left rudder and a guy up down in the conning tower trying to give it right rudder? You would have one heck of an electrical problem. Now, unfortunately, the uh, legend plates have kind of corroded some, but you can see one says bridge, another one says uh, conning tower, and there's a couple of others. So simply by moving this switch, they could select which steering position got to steer using the electricity. So as we swing around to the aft bulkhead of the aft steering compartment, we can now enter the steering gear room. Here's where the big tinker toys are. This is the actual turning gear for the rudder. This uses two mechanical rims that are attached to the rudder post. So let's try to get above it here. And you can see there's off in the distance, there's kind of a bell crank that this ram is attached to. That's actually on the top of the rudder post itself. When there's another one on the opposite side, when this one pulls, the other one pushes to turn the rudder. Now in between the two is this central shaft that as I turn back around and look forward, I get above it, here's that ram, and you can see that it's threaded. And if you'll look closely, this one takes a really close look and you can see there's a gap in the threads. Well, the threads on this side, uh, this close in, are uh, in, a clock, uh, in a clockwise rotation. The ones on the other side are in a counterclockwise rotation. Riding upon each set of these threads is this sleeve that's attached to, this, to the ram itself. And you can see there's a, a, a hinge or a pivot there. There's a, the same kind of sleeve on the other side attached to the opposing side ram. Now, since they're threaded in opposite directions, what happens is when that center shaft is rotated in a clockwise rotation, this ram is pushed back and through its linkage, pushes against the, uh, the rudder post in that direction. The one on the opposite side does, this, does it in the opposite direction. So once again, this is where we get kind of a push-pull effect. These are the big boys. These are the big parts. This is also protected by, as I recall, about three inches of armored deck above. This is what uh, some folks like to call a turtle back. Now when I go further back when I zoom in more, Let's see, yeah, we can see it from there. You can see that actually on the top of that rudder post, there's an arm that sticks out. This is a brake band. I'll try to crawl under this to where we can get a closer look at it. But one thing that you don't want when that rudder isn't being actively turned, you don't want the water pressure, hydraulic pressure, force it against that rudder to be constantly jamming up against all of this gear equipment. And also, you want that rudder to stop as quickly as possible when you're uh, finished turning it. So that's what this is for. That lever tightens a brake band that applies the brakes to the rudder. Now let me see if I can crawl under this thing here to where we can get a better look at it from, from the other side. So here we are. There's that rod. The, that I mentioned when I was in aft steering. 
at some point there was some type of gearing attached to that that could be used to actuate that brake band. I don't know where it is or exactly what it looked like. But we can now do a better job of seeing the brakes that uh, sits around it. There's also in the center of it, way back there, that vertical tube, that shot lubricant down into the uh, rudder post bearings. So this is pretty much how the rudder works. Now one last thing to mention is that there's an immense amount of gearing involved here. So here is your input shaft coming from the steam steering or electric motor that's turning a rather small gear that in turn turns this very large gear that's inside of the housing there. We can see it a little better. So there's considerable gearing there. Here is the uh, input shaft from the hand steering. Again, you can see it's significantly geared up. You could also see there's this hand wheel here. That hand wheel is important because you don't want those, those uh, steering wheels, manual wheels, turning whenever the rudder does. So by turning this, this actually unscrews this gear and as you can see here, it's mostly disengaged, but this allows you to disengage the uh, manual steering gear from the main turning gear. Lastly, uh, the rudder itself is what's called a balanced rudder. And what that means is, uh, about, a th about a third of its overall length extends ahead of the rudder post. This is almost like power steering because without that, every ounce of force of the water hitting that rudder is going to fight and produce stress that wants to keep you from turning the rudder. But by having part of it extending ahead of the rudder post, as you start to turn the rudder, that leading portion of it, when it gets hit by water, actually helps you turn the rudder. It takes a lot of that torque produced by the water flow off of the rudder post. So here we have the steering gear. Now, this is an old archaic style design and one of the last ships that used it. After this, they used hydraulic rams with hydraulics to turn it, or uh, in some cases, they used what were called water buried, gear, water buried gears or hydraulic speed motors that were almost identical to the ones used uh, to turn turrets and elevate the barrels. But they were very effective at producing uh, a continuous, uh, continuously variable amount of pressure and torque uh, to provide steering. Now one last thing to show here at the steering gear room is how do you calibrate all those uh, steering indicators that you have on the bridge and a number of other locations that shows rotor angle. Well, this is it. This is your ultimate gauge. Where else better than mounted on the actual steering gear? Now if you look at it, let see if I can get this light at a good angle. You can see that it starts at zero and then extends out to basically uh, one, two, three, 44 degrees to starboard and then from zero to 40 degrees port. Now look at what it's saying here. It's actually there's zero degrees, it's just right above that screw head. Now, if you start counting, according to this, the rudder is sitting at 14 degrees to port. And that's true. The rudder is basically frozen in place. And this is the part where it don't lie. This is telling you what it is. Now, it can't be repaired without using cutting torches, essentially destroying the rudder and rudder post to fix it. And it's just not worth it to try to do that. Uh, what they found is that the ship tows easily enough. Now the stern will want to skid to one side, but that's easily corrected using uh, tugs to keep it tracking straight.